So let's start here. Uh, this is a very small, brief question, at least in the setup. You were given this cubic function, you were told it had one real root, and then you were asked to solve for k. You were asked to solve for k. All right? So, the first thing that most of you thought, uh, most of you, is you thought, okay, it's to do with roots. I'm going to go for, and it's, it's also to do with one of the coefficients, I'm going to go for like sum and product of roots and all the different combinations thereof for a cubic function, okay? So you would say, oh, okay, I can do the sum of the roots one at a time, and I can do them two at a time. Uh, let's see, whoops. Plus alpha gamma, uh, hold on. I feel like I'm missing one. Alpha, gamma. alpha no, but no, that's it. Um, and then at three at a time, okay? <laughs> So you went there, but you couldn't get very far. You couldn't get very far because there just wasn't enough information given to you to use this. There wasn't any like, oh, this root and that root. Here's some information that will help you distinguish between them. So if you floundered around trying to do something here that was at least valid internally, then you probably got one or two if you went a very long way, but you simply couldn't get to a value of k. Right? Um, next, in a similar vein, some people thought, that's cool, I know about real roots, I'll just throw the discriminant at it. Cool. And most of you said, you know, the discriminant, b squared minus 4ac. The only problem with that is that this is the discriminant for, not cubics, but quadratic functions. Right? Cubics have a discriminant, um, but for a very obvious reason we don't look at them, because there's more coefficients, the discriminant is not this nice, simple thing, it's this awful, it takes like half a page to write the discriminant, okay? So, and none of you actually did the discriminant. So that wasn't very useful, okay? So how do you approach it? How do you approach it? Um, the, the simplest, most, the clearest way, most direct way is the calculus, okay? So here's the situation that I can envision. I've got two cases, okay? This is a cubic, right? Now, you have a look and you look at the, the leading coefficient. The leading coefficient? What's the leading coefficient in this case? It's 1. The leading coefficient is the coefficient of the leading term. The leading term is the one with the degree in it, right? It's cubed. Okay? So being that it's 1, or more specifically it's positive 1, okay, you already know roughly what this thing is going to look like. right? Um, all cubics have this kind of characteristic shape. If you want one real root, here's one example of how it might look. Um, there you go. That's got one real root. Okay. Um, you might notice, for instance, that I can't have, you know, say um, something like this. I can't have something like this. Despite the fact that this only intersects with the um, x-axis one time, it doesn't have one real root. How many real roots does that have? This is a cubic, right? I think it's got three. It's got three. They just all happen to be at the same spot. Okay? Uh, and we looked at this under multiplicity of roots. So that's not an option. This works. This works. One real root. Okay? But this is not the only way to have one real root, right? What's another alternative? How could I change this so it would be... Because remember, what is this k? This k is just an up-down thing. Okay? It's, um, it's our vertical constant, okay? So as I change this value, I shift up or I shift down, okay? If I shift up, I just have the same kind of curve, right? But I if I shift down, if I shift far down enough so that both these stationary points are below the axis, something like this, Morning. then this also has one real root, okay? Now, these are the only two cases. This is case one. And this is case two. There is no other way for a cubic to have one real root. Okay? So now you're looking at the, okay, well what makes it, what, what makes case one case one, and what makes case two case two? Well, I can see that if this stationary point here, this local minimum, right? If it was any lower than here, I'm in trouble, right? So I'm looking for this minimum. Okay, if I can get its y value to be above the axis, to be greater than zero, uh, if I can get y to be greater than 0 for this value, then I'm good, okay? In exactly the same way, but in reverse, if you get this maximum here, okay, and if you get the maximum below the axis, y is less than 0, in the same way, you're home and host, okay? So, how do I get these stationary points? Let's call this thing, let's call this um, 
polynomial, P. Okay, so differentiate, right? P dash. Even those of you who didn't do it this way can tell me right now. It's an easy enough one to compute. What is the derivative of P? You're going to start with 3x squared, right? Minus 6x minus 24. Okay, there you go. There's the derivative. What am I after again? What am I looking for? I'm looking for stationary points, right? So I'm going to let this equal to 0. So when you solve that, 3x squared minus 6x minus 24 equals 0 for stationary points. You get, uh, we can divide 3 by 3, obviously. So you get this. Okay, factorize for me. It's a nice easy one. What are our factors? 2 and negative 4. 2 and negative 4. Okay, so you're going to get this. So now I know I have stationary points here, right? Stationary points there. But of course, those values themselves, the x values, they're not of that much use to me, right? Because they tell me negative 2 and 4. They tell me horizontally where I'm situated. But I'm not interested in horizontal. I'm interested in up down. I want to get this minimum high enough or this maximum low enough. Okay? That's negative 2. Oh, my scale died. You get the idea. Okay? So if what I want is actually the y value, I'm going to need to take these and pop them back into my original equation. Well, I, I named it p. Okay? So I'm going to say, well, what's p of negative 2? p of negative 2. Which, by the way, you don't need any calculus to see that that's going to be the maximum. Right? Um, it's because of the leading coefficient, like I said, it's sine. What is p of negative 2? I think you evaluate it. I've already evaluated it. You get, don't forget there's a k in there, you get k plus 28. Okay? So you can see, based on the value of k, you're going to move that stationary point up and down. Okay? So this one, what did I say, negative 2? This is the, um, that's the max. Okay, right there. The other stationary point is the minimum, and that's at p of 4. Okay? And I think from memory you get k minus 80 when you slap it in. Okay? So now what do I want? I want the maximum, let's look at this case, this is case 2. I want the maximum to be below 0. Okay? So maybe I should have done it in order. All right. Case 1. I want the minimum to be above, k minus 80 to be above the axis, okay? From which you get k is greater than 80, and then you look at case 2, the one I started with. I want this one to be below the axis, because this is the maximum. Uh, am I looking at the right thing? Yes, that's the minimum. Okay, so k is less than negative 28. There you go these two values. So you've got k is greater than 80 or k is less than negative 28. Okay. Now, there was just one other way that you could think about this. Um, apart from doing this and saying, oh, I want them to be um, positive, negative, you can come back to these two and you can see something quite clever. Um, have a look at case one and case two, right? I can not only think about the minimum being such and such a height, I can see that in both cases, right, I've got, for instance, this stationary point and this stationary point. I want them both on the same side of the axis, right? So in other words, they're both positive, yes? If one of them's below and one of them's above, I'm in trouble. Here, I've got both stationary points and they're both below the axis, right? They're both negative, okay? So again, if I've got one above and one below, I'm in trouble. So here, they're both positive, right? So whatever the values are, like they can be anything, there's a big range. I want um, k, sorry, yeah, k plus 28, k minus 80, okay? When you multiply them to positive numbers or to be positive, right? Does that make sense? And then here, I want, well, when I multiply them together, two negatives, two negatives, the two negatives should cancel, right? So in fact, this case and this case they both share this in common, right? That it's, it's a bit more obscure, but you can see it's, it's kind of an elegant way to go about it. It's like, I want both of these to be on the same side of the axis, which means if I take their product, it ought to be positive, okay? So that's an alternative. Writing that line in green is an alternative to going through this, but you can see it gives you exactly the same solution, okay? Um, it's, just a, it's just a quadratic, and you get its inequality, okay?